morning. We're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of everybody's time. We'll get through this as quickly as we can because I know you all have um, other things to get to today. Um, but before we get started, I have a couple of reminders for everybody. Thank you for the people who are joining us online. This is going to be recorded and it will be sent out with the presentation materials after this presentation. So you'll have a reference back. That's what we discussed today. Um, and then second thing, um, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Skubanek for coming today. And um, he's going to give us some opening and welcoming remarks. So Dr. Skubanek. Emily, could I ask that you start the recording when I conclude my comments? Because <laughs> I'm going to say some things that might seem a bit strange. And I mentioned to Ron that I was going to do this. He said, are you going to say that? You know, when the announcements uh, and deadlines come for the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health or the Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, we don't gather together and say, would you like to submit a proposal? So why do we do this? Did it ever cross your mind? No. <laughs> well, it, it, it mine, so why? This, this, is a difference. this is a different situation in that if you look at the Helen Jones and um, CH Foundation, uh, they have given probably more than $100 million to Texas Tech. And what's unique about this opportunity is it's a, a chance to engage almost any academic discipline on this campus. That's different. So that's one reason. And also, it's a chance to, get, to receive support for initiatives and programs that can have a real bearing upon this community in a way that a call from the National Science Foundation or the USDA would never. So there is something unique and different about this. So I thank you for doing this. I imagine for many of you, this is out of the realm of your norm. It could be out of the realm of your normal academic activity. And to take the time to do this, um, I, I think it, just know that it's appreciated. Um, when you talk about the CH Foundation and the Helen Jones Foundation, they're a great support of philanthropy, but also your scholarship and your research activity as it relates to this program. Um, just, I want to have some kudos here for Byron Kennedy, his advancement team, Emily and everyone. I didn't see the report today because it didn't come out, but I believe as of yesterday for giving this year, we're at over $232 million. Our goal this year was to raise $110 million. It, the record for the system, I believe, was somewhere between 170 and 180. That's for the entire system. Texas Tech has raised 230. What it says is, it, it speaks to the generosity of people who support this school. It speaks to the great people we have working in, in institutional advancement. But it also speaks to you, and I don't say that in a, grat a gratuitous way. If you didn't have the positive impact on those students who progressed through this university, they wouldn't go out there and then turn around and be so generous. Or if you weren't doing things that didn't build confidence in our alumni base and supporters that tech had a good trajectory, was doing the right things, they wouldn't do that. So I thank you for that. And also, Byron, thank you for all the people, all of your team that does this. So I hope the first part of the semester, I hope you're off to a good start. Hope you have a great year. Hello, Jerry. I, let me take this occasion to congratulate Dr. Boddy. I don't know if you saw about three weeks ago, the National Science Foundation did uh, award a grant to establish four research centers around the United States. One was at Duke, one was at um, uh, Duke, Columbia, Ohio State, and Texas Tech. And the total amount of that award, if you don't blow it in the first five years, <laughs> will be $51 million. It's the largest grant ever. But what's wonderful about that project is it involves a collaboration between uh, engineering, arts and sciences, and the Davis College of Agriculture. And also, it does something, and I think it kind of epitomizes what we'd like to do, make sure we're doing research and have, conducting scholarship that has an impact in our community. This is, deals with fertilizer production. Um, in reducing the impact on our environment and enhancing food security, global issues that we need to pay attention to.
So anyway, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the work you're going to do on this. And Emily, am I dismissed? You are dismissed. Great job. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's all right. You're afraid I will? or I made that one yesterday in your presence. So um, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the president has a much better mind for numbers than I do. He's a mathematician. He speaks with precision. Uh, when it comes to data, I'm an ecologist. I speak in round numbers when it comes to precision. <laughs> But I did remember one thing. I asked Byron. Um, that total amount that we've received from the CH and Helen Jones Foundation, $130 million, a little over. So remarkable. Um, you know that Christine De, uh, DeVitt and her sister Helen DeVitt Jones, when they started supporting this university 50 years ago, um, that we would be at this point of, of $130 plus million of support. And so, through the grants that these two foundations have given, they have supported work in a lot of areas. Um, education, healthcare, uh, agriculture, sustainability, the arts, cultural programming, and, and many more. Um, their generosity and, as Lawrence said, the hard work of uh, our faculty and the staff who support this work on this campus um, has allowed us to create and collaborate on a lot of research and, and creative programs. And it's helped thousands of students achieve their dream of attending college. So hard to overstate the impact um, of the two sisters and the two foundations um, on Texas Tech and the ability they have had to grow and leverage the impact uh, of you in, uh, in this room and online and may, many others as well. So today is really the formal call for proposals. Um, uh, information coming your way. I look forward to seeing the summation of these proposals and in uh, working with the president and, and making these recommendations. So um, our thanks to the two foundations, uh, my thanks along with the presidents for all the work, uh, the great work that all of you do. More great work coming through the generous support of CH and Helen Jones Foundation. So thank you. Thank you, Provost and Dirk. Thank you all. Uh, next, we'll have Byron Kennedy, Vice President of Advancement, to come up and talk a little bit more about each of the foundations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily, and thank you again all for uh, joining us here in person and online. Many of you who uh, are returners to this process and uh, to uh, obviously submissions in the past. And we greatly appreciate that. Obviously, as Lawrence and Ron both said, this does look different than most all call grant submissions for all the reasons mentioned. Um, these foundations are people that we know. There are community members, there are uh, visionaries, there are people that have been with us for decades and decades. And because of that relationship, you see the, um, the relational aspect of that. You see the connections that they expect of the president, of the provost, of ourself in advancement. But truly, not unlike what Lawrence said, um, the things that they fund are the work that you do, um, the impacts that you have. It's a very competitive process. Um, I, I usually give my spiel, and I would say Lawrence and Ron have definitely sampled from my planned remarks already, so I'll skip the parts that they've already said, but to say that a lot of the process that you see borne out is really uh, reflective of the sisters themselves. So uh, came from a ranching family outside of Level Land, grew up, you know, in this part of the country, what the old saying that hard land makes good people, um, frugality, uh, doing what you say you're going to do, honesty, follow through. That's hopefully what you see in the process. This process is fairly cumbersome, and I would say we would acknowledge that, and we appreciate you staying through. If these two people represent the look of what I just described, I, that's how I feel as well. In saying that this process, um, what we... in the way we're going to spend it. 
That can be challenging, no doubt. Don't hear me stand up here and say that I would understand all of the challenges of the timeline that we're looking at. But it is incredibly important to the foundations and in the way that we honor that relationship that we lay out a budget, we follow it, we hit those timelines. And in doing so, I think there's a little piece of Christine and Helen in all of these projects. To that point, it is a, a relationship that's over $130 million to the university. You'll be hard pressed to find areas of campus that haven't been affected um, by the generosity of these two. And so we take time when we do this all call to lay that out, to tell a little bit of that story and hope that that story continues to live on in their continued generosity. So we truly do appreciate um, all of the submissions, uh, the work that goes into it, some are funded, some are not. It allows us to go back to these relationships and say, Texas respect these foundations and we've put our best foot forward in our efforts here. So again, to you the submitters, Greatly appreciated. Good luck in the process. And I think Emily's going to give you a lot more of the specifics of how it works. Thanks, Byron. I appreciate you coming and talking about uh, these sisters and the important relationship that we have had with them over the years. So now, while you're all here, the nitty gritty part of it, um, for those that are joining us online, there will be a question and answer session after the presentation. So feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat and we'll answer that uh, afterwards. As for preliminary proposals, this is a two-step process starting with a preliminary proposal. Um, what they are looking for is volunteer services or programs that are going to impact the community, provide educational opportunities where other funding is not available. They will also support research projects and we'll get more into the specifics about which foundation will do that. Um, but that directly benefit the community. If you don't hear anything else today, please hear that the projects that you submit to them have to have a community component. Otherwise, um, it won't make it through uh, any of the rounds. So who can apply for these? Uh, TTU faculty, TTU staff. Um, you can have graduate students apply as long as they have a faculty member who is willing to be the PI for that grant. The faculty member, I'm sorry, the graduate student themselves cannot actually submit the application. It needs to be under the faculty member's name, but the graduate student can be the one working on the project. So first we're gonna start with the CH Foundation. For those of you that have been coming to this presentation for a while, you may think, oh, this looks different. This is a new presentation. And it is because the process this year has changed for these foundations. Um, it is not the same for both foundations, so therefore we are splitting it up into two components now. So we'll start with the CH Foundation. Uh, this is, like Byron said, this is a very competitive process and it is becoming more and more competitive as the years go on. This is because the CH Foundation is really wanting to move into impactful projects. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean larger funding, it just means that they want to have more of an impact in the community to be those grants that then would fund um, an NIH, an NSF, things like that. Um, so therefore, we have added more layers to this process to make it more competitive. Uh, so the first thing that happens in this process is you submit your proposals, preliminary proposals to your dean, executive director, whoever is in charge of your unit. They then will rank and give feedback on all of the proposals that are submitted from that unit or that college. Those proposals come to my office, which I review along with my team. And then what we do is we take those proposals and we put them into buckets. We rank them on one, two, and three um, based off of how well they fit within the strategic priority of the university and how well they fit within the foundation's priorities, which we'll go over in a minute. Once that's done, our rankings are then sent to the foundation who reviews these preliminary proposals, and then they determine which proposals get pushed to the final round. In the final round, that's where you'll have the opportunity to expand upon your proposal, give more detail, things like that. Then those final proposals are sent to the VPR, the president, and uh, the provost for an additional ranking. And that ranking is based off of a one through 
however many proposals are submitted for that year. Um, and then that is sent to the foundation and the rest of the trustees to make a determination which ones are moving forward. So when you're thinking about submitting to the CH Foundation, you need to be thinking about, is my project within a strategic priority of the university? Does it fit within one of the four buckets of the foundation? And does it have a community impact to it? I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but that will be, I will send this um, with all of the materials, but this is an example of the ranking spreadsheet um, that we go through with my office and then with the president's office. Um, this here says it fits a university priority. It has an impact beyond the university. There's an opportunity for collaboration. It allows for higher levels of funding and it's diverse and unique. Um, and then those are totaled up and that gives us kind of a official, unofficial ranking to submit to each of the foundations. So what is the CH Foundation looking for? Again, directly impacts the Lubbock or surrounding communities. It offers tangible benefits. This is not something that we're just going to go into the community and then not be able to provide anything back. Um, the surrounding communities, we would consider the 13 counties surrounding Lubbock. It provides a unique service that's not otherwise available. This includes a projects that the CH Foundation is already funding in the community. Um, educational opportunity for TTU or local students that we aren't providing otherwise. Uh, collaboration with community organizations. If you are collaborating with any of these outside partners or even internal partners, if you are the College of Arts and Sciences and you are collaborating with the Davis College, the foundation would like to see a letter of support from both of those colleges so they know that everybody's on the same page. Um, this, the letter of support, if you can get it in the preliminary proposal round, it will help you um, if your project is chosen to move on to a final proposal. Um, something that does not require, require long-term funding from the foundation um, or outside funding. So they traditionally do not fund projects for multi year. Two years is really their max limit for a project. Um, and those are on very special occasions. For example, we had uh, 16 projects that were funded this year. Two of them were multi-year and it's only because they had a component to it that the foundation felt like it needed to be a two-year project. Um, and then it's a strong candidate for higher levels of funding beyond the local foundations. A couple of years ago, we had a project that was funded for a sepsis DNA detector. It started with the CH Foundation. That funding then allowed that faculty member to submit to other organizations, which he then received funding from those higher levels. Um, those are the types of projects that this foundation is really looking to fund. There are seven trustees that sit on this board, so there are seven people that have some type of knowledge of all of the all of the major components within our economy. So oil, gas, ranching, energy, things like that, um, that sit on this board. So they do have a wealth of knowledge about some of these projects, but please remember that they don't specialize in this. So when you write these proposals, you have to you have to write them in a way that we're talking to somebody who may not understand fully what's going on. Projects they are likely to fund, again, community and neighborhood improvement, youth services, cultural programs, agriculture, ranching, heritage, education, health sciences, uh, research benefiting the community. There is a proposal process for the Health Sciences Center for the CH Foundation that is separate from the process at TTU. So if you are collaborating with a faculty member at the Health Sciences Center, then the two of you should determine who is going to submit this proposal? Is it on the TTU side or is it on the Health Sciences Center side? Because the Health Sciences Center side does not submit as many proposals and they go through a completely different ranking process than the university side does. These are uh, the buckets that I was talking about for the founder's intent and how we rank them. Uh, the first one is education. Founders Intent, Christine DeVitt, truly believed in the value of education. So your proposal needs to have an educational component to it. Ranch, range, and rural, so this would include oil and gas, 
royalties, anything that has to do with um, the oil field. For example, one of the projects that they funded last year was driver safety on roadways that are dealing with heavy oil field traffic. Um, they own the Mallet Ranch. So ranching is very important to them, whether that's ranch management, whether it's actually something that takes place on the ranch, um, or research that is, that is happening on the ranch, even um, animals that live on the ranch. There was a prairie chicken project that they funded because they lived on the ranch. Um, higher education, strengthening the promotion of TTU. This is really important to them. They want to fund projects that are going to promote the university. They truly believe that Texas Tech is the best university on the planet, and they want to do things that help promote us in a positive light. They love uh, the arts. It was one of their original founding, um, original intents of Mrs. Christine DeWitt. Um, she, tr she believed that the arts were underrepresented and spent a lot of her time focusing on making sure that the arts were a benefit and available to, to all students, to all people in the community. Uh, and then the museum. Some funding restrictions, salary stipends and fringe benefits. They do allow for stipends for graduate students. However, I will tell you if 50% or more of your budget is graduate salaries, they're going to question it. Um, they, they like them and they'll fund them, but they don't want it to be most of what you're asking for. Fringe benefits, they need to come internally. Um, there was a gentleman, I believe, this year who was able to apply for a grant, I believe it's in the provost's office, that was able to help offset some of those cost of fringe benefits for one of the students that um, the grant funded. Non-students, we do allow for stipends and expenses for visiting faculty, guests, honorarium, things like that, um, but they will not pay them solely to incentivize them to come to TTU. Um, and there is uh, no salaries for faculty or staff existing or new, no exceptions at all to that rule. They're likely not to fund, um, they're not likely to fund anything that's international, although the CH Foundation will uh, review the request. Um, Projects that mirror programs that are closely, that they're already funding in the community, like I said, if there's something that mirrors something that's already happening in the community with another nonprofit organization or within another school district, uh, they're likely not to fund that. Um, projects that have extremely narrow themes are benefiting only a narrow segment of the population. They want these projects to be of the benefit of the majority of individuals. Um, and if your project is focusing on a very specific thing, then they are likely to not fund that. The School of Veterinary Medicine, this is a tricky one because it's actually a TTU school, but it's based in Amarillo, which is not a community that the CH Foundation funds. However, there is an exception to that, that if the project, even though it's from the School of Veterinary Medicine, if the project is going to be based in Lubbock and affect Lubbock citizens, it can be submitted. If it's going to be conducted in Amarillo or to pay for any equipment in Amarillo, anything like that, then they will not consider that project. Uh, and then anything that has unrestricted funds. Helen Jones Foundation. Not as, as many requirements to this one. Still a very competitive process, um, but you'll notice that we're missing several steps here. This foundation is going to be less research heavy, more community impact, more programmatic heavy. Um, there is still a confidential ranking and feedback provided by the Dean Executive Director of each of the units. It then comes um, to me for review and consideration, um, and then it's presented to the foundation. At that point in time, there's no ranking done by my office, more just feedback on the projects. Uh, and then the executive director of the foundation will decide which preliminary proposals move forward. You'll move forward into the final proposal round where uh, you will submit your projects and there is no ranking done at that point in time with Helen Jones. Again, projects that directly impact the community, you're really gonna get tired of me saying community, but 
please keep that in mind. Um, provides a unique service, not otherwise available, so very similar to the CH Foundation. Educational opportunities, collaboration. Again, the project that will not require long-term funding. This is a um, foundation, excuse me, that does not consider multi-year projects. So they never will consider it unless it has been a project that has been vetted by the president's office and that is going to be extremely impactful. So more of those larger term, longer term projects um, will they consider here. These are traditionally 12 months. And then higher levels um, of funding beyond that. Uh, that last bullet, the strong candidate for higher levels, they do take this into consideration, but not as much as the CH Foundation does. Uh, they do look at that and they care about it, but their, their true um, reason for choosing things would be these top three bullets. Community impact, a unique service, and educational opportunities. Likely to fund... Uh, outreach, cultural programming, ranching heritage, agriculture, education, visual performing arts, and the museum. So you'll notice here um, there's not research on this one. They again will fund salaries for graduate or undergraduate students, but like the CH Foundation, it doesn't need to be the majority of your budget and your fringe benefits will need to be covered by your department. Um, they will not pay stipends again to solely incentivize and no salaries for faculty and staff. This foundation will not consider anything international. Where the CH Foundation will look at it, Helen Jones will not even, even look at the project as if it has an international component to it. Uh, they do not consider projects for the Health Sciences Center, the Rawls College of Business, the Whitaker College of Engineering, or the School of Veterinary Medicine. So, um, you can tell here that they're really focused on those colleges that may not receive as much funding as others, education, the arts, the museum, library, uh, et cetera. Uh, again, narrow themes, or benefit, narrow themes or benefiting a narrow segment of the population and then unrestricted funds. So this is a two-step application process like I mentioned um, at the beginning. The, you're here today, so that's really step one. I guess it's really three steps. Your next step is your preliminary proposal. These will be due fall of 2022. There's a, a date um, in the next couple of slides, but it'll be October uh, 2022. Um, if you are selected to move forward after the preliminary proposal round, you will be given a final proposal template to submit, which will be due in the spring of 2023. Um, the awards are announced in July of 23 and funding in January of 24. So we're in September of 2022. So we are a year and a half out from when you could expect to receive funding if you are selected. So it's very important that when you're putting these proposals together, you remember that timeline and you account for fluctuations in budget or changes in the proposal right now. Preliminary proposals, um, these are short, short proposals here, um, one to two page project pitch with a cover page, um, and it's a template that's provided by my office, so after this presentation, all of you will receive all of this material um, if you decide to submit. You should give special consideration to the name of your project. This is the first thing that the foundations see when they look at the proposals, it's also the first thing that I see. It's also the first thing that your dean and director see. So it's important that your title is appropriate for the project. It can't be too long or overly technical. If you make it to the final stage with the CH Foundation, they actually have character limits on the proposal. Your title can only be 500 characters. So that's why we ask in the preliminary round, we keep it as concise as possible. Um, please give consideration to the impact it will have. And like I said, on the budget, please be very cognizant of what things may look like a year and a half from now, if you can, um, because it is hard to go back and change that budget once it's accepted. Here's some basic questions to think about when writing your preliminary proposal. Like I said, it doesn't need to be long, two pages at the most, it just needs to tell your story, what the project is, what you're gonna do with it, and how you're gonna use your funds. 
So drafts are due by Monday, October 3rd, with final versions delivered on Monday, October 24th. The drafts are due to me. And what this is, it gives me the opportunity to review projects, to provide any feedback to you before you submit it to your college um, and before they rank it. So these are my deadlines, but your college will have their own internal deadlines. So your college has development directors, most of them do, or executive directors within the unit. If there's not one, then I will be your development officer. So please use the development officers within your college to make sure that you are following their college deadlines. Final proposals. If, you're move, if you are chosen, here are the dates for those. Again, drafts and then the final version. CH is a online process. So it's not anything that you have to submit um, to me in person. I'll do everything online with those. It'll be uploaded. You'll get notification that, that it was uploaded. Uh, and then the awards will be announced in the summertime. So if you're chosen and you receive funding, you will submit an annual grant report at the end of your grant year. They're due by December 1st of every year. The grants run on the calendar year for both foundations. So every grant runs January 1 through December 31st. Um, it gets a little bit confusing with our fiscal year and some accounting, but um, we make it work. We have financial checks throughout the year to let you know where you are. Um, and if you get close to the end of the year and you still have money left in your account, there are grant extensions available. However, the both foundations um, think of it as a black eye if you're not able to spend your money within the year. Grant cycle for you to go back to um, just as an FYI. And again, I'll give a shout out to our development director. Some of them are here today. Um, they're wonderful. They know this process. They are a really big help to everybody in the college. So I just encourage you to please use them because if it's not a fit for CH and Helen Jones, then likely they know somebody else that it might be a fit for. Um, so if you don't know them, I would encourage you to get to know them um, because they can help push your projects forward. Okay, that's the end. So we'll take, we'll do questions in the audience first and then Becca, I'll ask for questions if there are any online. Does anybody have any questions? I, I killed it. Yeah, what's up? So your question is, is it okay to pay for a guest lecture who is, who is a Texas Tech University professor? Um, that's a little bit of a gray area. Um, my, my comment is going to be, let's talk about what the project looks like and what type of reimbursement you're wanting to do. Um, chances of that happening are probably not that great. But we can, we can go a little bit further um, if you choose to, to do that. Yes, ma'am. The question is, is there a list of funded projects? And there is not. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> uh, I should actually address this every year because we get this question every year. Uh, no, there is not a list of funded projects. However, um, we can give generalities. I will say that for this last year, we had over 60 preliminary proposals that were submitted. 30 of them went through to a final and 15 were chosen for funding for a little bit over a million dollars. Yes. Uh, question is, is it okay to submit to both foundations? Uh, yes, it is okay. However, I would suggest that if you're going to submit to both foundations, you do completely separate projects. Or if you're going to submit the same project to both foundations, that you look at breaking up your budget. Um, the foundations do talk every year. So if a project is funded 
um, by the same or submitted to the both foundations um, and they both like the project, then one will take X amount and the other will take the other amount to give you a completely funded project. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, is Helen Jones against research? No, they're not against research. They're not. They, it's just not, if they were looking at a research project versus a community impact project, they're going to lean towards community impact. If it's a, hi if it's a hybrid, that's even better. Um, but they don't, they don't look at the research component as strongly as they would what the community impact is going to be. I, uh, so I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head that um, this is going to be not a great, not a great example, but there was a project funded recently by the Helen Jones Foundation. It was for a collection uh, that was brought to the university to do research on the collection. Um, and it was to be utilized by everybody in the community. Uh, the collection was to be taken out into the community and used in the community at schools, um, at classes at tech, but students were allowed to come and use the collection to conduct research. Does that help? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Space for a community project. It's not, it's not out of the question. It's something that they would consider. However, my question back is what funding level are we looking at? Uh, and is it a priority of the university to renovate this space? If you have a project that um, is going to be a large ask, I would say 250000 and above, the foundation does like to know that the university is behind the project. And typically, those types of ask we need to discuss prior to submitting a preliminary proposal to give the foundations a heads up. I would say that falls within the too narrow of a population. Um, they really want it to be of the benefit to everyone and not a segmented population, race or gender, anything like that. The, are, are you asking us to fill a dollar amount? Um, okay, the question is what's the average range of, of proposals funded in terms of dollar amount? Um, the largest group of proposals funded this year was in the um, twenty-five dollars to $75,000 range. Any other questions in the audience? Okay. Becca? Would you advise against writing two-year proposals for the CH Foundation, even if the project would benefit from a longer time frame? No. I would still encourage the proposal be written for two years. That's it. Okay. If there's nothing else, I thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. If you have any questions or want to discuss any of the projects that you are considering further, please feel free to reach out to me um, anytime and I'd be happy to sit down and go over them with you. Thank you so much.